previously in nucleic acids, we talked about this uh, definition of smooth, and we talked about isolating DNA uh, from these components. And uh, we said that we just really needed some salt water, some detergent, some alcohol, and really for the most part, the work is fairly done for us. We just need to get rid of all the trash that comes along and isolate the DNA on its own. And this is the first time that DNA kind of gets isolated. And this is what really begins the whole discussion that DNA is the carrier and not protein because this is the stuff that was there that was getting transferred over. Now, we still don't really have 100% proof that this is a genetic carrier, which is why when Avery made the statement, he said that DNA is the substance that makes up genes and chromosomes. He did not say this was a genetic carrier. Somebody else does that. So this is the first step in the right direction. We have now placed an importance on this stuff that we are calling nucleic acid or DNA. And now we've kind of learned that, well, we can see some transfer that happens. And if we see transfer that happens, then maybe your parents' genes could be transferred to you in the same way way. Okay, so yeah, you've got to kind of imagine yourself as a little virus mating with another little virus and making little virus babies because that's kind of what's happening here. That's what they're trying to prove. So in the next uh, kind of couple of years, what we see in mid-1950s, this thing called the Hershey Chase Experiment. Now, Hershey chocolate bar Hershey? Well, no, not that Hershey. Of course, that would be kind of neat, but not that Hershey. Okay, so we get this man named Alfred Hershey. And finally, a woman, Martha Chase. Very often, if you've noticed, every time we have presented the scientist, well, they've been men. They have not been minority, and they have not been women. Mainly, they have been Caucasian men. And finally, we get this person, a woman, 1950s, that begins to make a name for herself. And this is called the Hershey Chase Experiment. And what they do is that they want to make sure that, well... We want to make sure DNA is the genetic carrier. How can we do that? How can we take a look at DNA and how can we do some testing on DNA and prove that the DNA is the carrier and not protein? So they look at the chemical composition. And what they do is that they look at amino acids and they look at these things called nucleotides and they begin to compare them. And they begin to say, okay, well, both of them have carbon, so we'll rule that out. Both of them have hydrogen, we rule that out. Both of them have oxygen, we'll rule that out. And then they take a look and they say, well, proteins and amino acids, they have sulfur in them. Two amino acids have sulfur-containing groups. You know what those are. That's methionine and cysteine. Nucleotides, on the other hand, they don't have sulfur. So, Eureka! We found a difference. So, Hershey and Chase go into the lab and they say, okay, one of the ways that we can distinguish the difference between proteins and nucleic acids in the laboratory is that we focus on sulfur. Proteins and amino acids will have sulfur in them, and nucleic acids and nucleotides and DNA, that doesn't have sulfur. So we need to bring in a form of sulfur in the laboratory that's a little bit different that we can keep track of. And they go, okay, well, let's find one more difference at least. You know, is there something that these DNA molecules have that amino acids don't? And the answer is yes. And that element is phosphorus. And they go, Eureka, we got it. 
So what we'll do is that we'll bring into the lab a sulfur and that will help us label proteins and amino acids. And then we'll bring in phosphorus. And because phosphorus is not found in any of the amino acids or proteins, don't believe me, go look at the structures. You were supposed to memorize those. Did you ever write down a phosphorus? I don't think so. You didn't. So we can take that phosphorus into the lab and we can use that phosphorus and label the DNA with it. So now we're talking about radio labeling. We're talking about the concept that I can bring in an element, a radioactive element, maybe an isotope of the element, and I can bring this element in and label a protein with it that I can pick up with some type of instrument much later. And then I can bring phosphorus in, and that could be an isotope, and I could use that and label DNA with it, and then maybe use an instrument that will pick that up as well. But this is the concept of radio labeling. So we see phosphorus 32 being used to label the DNA molecules. Now if you look on the periodic table you will find that phosphorus is 30.97 so 31 so this is a heavy fat little phosphorus that we are using to weigh down in a way to mark to put like a white flag on DNA and say this is DNA I can keep track of DNA as long as I look at this P32. We do the same thing with sulfur. If you look at sulfur on the periodic chart, you're going to see that sulfur weighs 32.06. So what they do is that they bring in a fat little sulfur, an isotope of sulfur. And this sulfur is S35. And they say, okay, this is the flag that is going to mark the carbon. This is the flag that's going to mark the amino acids and the proteins. So if I just take a look at this S35, it's a heavy little atom. And because of that, I can now keep track of it. Okay, so what they do is that they target this thing called the T2 phage. We're going to call that the mosquito virus. And DNA of that virus was labeled with P32. And then they took the virus and they put it in the presence of E. coli. And the virus does its thing. It goes through like one of those nasty zombies on Walking Dead. And it begins to bite and chew on the E. coli and the virus begins to spread one E. coli to another E. coli. And then they take these infected E. coli that now have been infected and they isolate them. And they take them in the lab and they begin to monitor them. And they begin to use an instrument, a radioactive instrument, kind of like an x-ray, right? And it begins to pick up this radioactivity that's been given off. And they find out that out of the two choices, it's phosphorus that's there. They put sulfur in as well. Sugar, or the amino acids, the proteins. They put this heavy sulfur in the virus. That did not get transferred. E. coli had no signs of sulfur at all, only phosphorus. Eureka, they've made a discovery moment. What they have found out by doing this is that the virus has transferred heavy phosphorus into the E. coli. And the only thing that has phosphorus in it is DNA, which means that this virus transferred its DNA into the E. coli. The virus did not transfer amino acids and proteins to the E. coli and all of a sudden they have physical proof now that DNA is the genetic carrier. This is what is transferring from one cell to the next to make this non-virulent cell virulent now.
It wasn't amino acids. It wasn't protein like we had thought for years. It was this poor little stupid tetranucleotide that did it. This nucleotide that only consisted of four different possibilities. This is what was getting transferred from one cell to the next. It kind of just blows people's minds. They don't really understand it at all. And not only that, but Avery rolled over in his grave because he said, you know, I started this whole mess, and now you're going to give these people a Nobel Prize for what they've done when it was really me that kind of broke the dam on this? And in 1969, Hershey and Chase received the Nobel Prize for their discovery. But what makes it different is that Hershey and Chase literally had proof and said, made the statement that DNA is the genetic carrier. And this is how we proved it. We used heavy phosphorus. Could you imagine? Heavy phosphorus. That's all that they did. They labeled DNA with heavy phosphorus. They brought the virus on the E. coli. It transferred, made the E. coli a virus, and then figured out Phosphorus got transferred. That means DNA was transferred. That means that that is the genetic carrier out of the two. And that is what we call the Hershey Chase experiment. So this diagram is going to show you in pictures what the Hershey Chase experiment is going to do. So here is the virus. It's this nasty looking tripod with a head. That's what we call the T2 phage. And the T2 phage comes in and sits down on top of the E. coli. And it squirts its DNA, in a way, into the E. coli cell. Well, this poor little virus then can die and go off on its own. Who cares what happens to it after that point? But this E. coli now has the T2 phage DNA inside of it. And the T2 phage DNA begins to convert this E. coli over into really the virus. And then what we see is that we can begin to separate this E. coli out. We can do the studies on the E. coli, and that's exactly what they did with the Hershey chase experiment okay uh, the same things happening down here to the bottom we now see that uh, another uh, virus comes in infects the bacteria and we see that the DNA and the E. coli is there and then we see that this virus kind of goes off on its own and does whatever um, but in one route what happens is that this is red meaning that this is the one that's been labeled. So this is your heavy phosphorus. So heavy phosphorus gets squirted into the E. coli, and then we can pick that heavy phosphorus up by doing the test. Down here at the bottom, it's the same story, but what happens here is that we have coated with the sulfur because those are the sugars, those are the amino acids, those are the proteins, and it's protein that makes up this coating. So this coating of the virus is heavy labeled the DNA is not so it squirts the DNA in well the DNA is not labeled it's this red piece that's labeled and this virus goes off on its own and there's no radioactivity that gets picked up in the E. coli cell because of that so this shows that really it's the DNA that gets transferred over and they had physical proof now that because of the use of the phosphorus radio labels because of that they now have proof that DNA is the genetic carrier. Okay, so with that said, we're going to stop the video here. We have more backstory, though, and this backstory is going to concern a person, two people, named Watson and Crick. But, you know, there's other people that get left out of the story as well, and we'll talk about that, too. But we'll take a focus on Watson and Crick. We'll look at their importance. What did they bring to the table? And why do we talk about them all the time? So in the next video, that's what we'll do. We'll keep the soap opera up.